Hi everyone. I come from Sri Lanka. Come on, don't look at me like that. <laughs> it's alright. I'll get over it. I spent my first 20 years growing up in Sri Lanka. During those years, I experienced a country brought to its knees by war. The Tamil Tigers fighting for a separate state up the north with the battle spilling out into the capital where I was growing up. The Maoists fighting for a separate state down the south of the country. My childhood memories are peppered with images of suicide bombings, mass assassinations, sweet mangoes, color, flare, gentle Buddhism, and murder. The contrasts of life were stark in front of me. I remember playing cricket down the street, and boom, a sound would go in the distance, and we'd see a cloud of crows flying out in the air, and we know, ah, oh, a suicide bombing. Just 300 meters away, the game of cricket was just momentarily interrupted, and we go back to it, and the crows would descend to feed off the parts. We were numbed to the terror as young kids. I grew up in a household of comfort, of superficiality, of, of pretense. We would listen to Bing Crosby religiously on Sunday afternoons and eat crab curry. And the excess food from that meal would go into the bins. And over the wall of our compound, a young child would die of starvation. All of a wall was the biggest slum in Sri Lanka, in Colombo. On one of those games of cricket, I was on the cusp of my first half century, 49 not out, Nidhu David charging towards me with tennis ball in hand, trying to focus, excited, my heart was beating. And yet, I couldn't, I couldn't concentrate because from the corner of my eye, I could see an old, old, weakening man staggering towards us. The sun was beating down 35 degrees in the middle of our monsoonal heat, 3.30 in the afternoon. And this man weakened with every step he took. And try as I did to concentrate, I, I couldn't. And we stopped the game of cricket and I went up to him and I caught him just in time as he was about to collapse. We got some water, revived him and he told me that he had walked from a town in Moratua, 20 kilometers away, walked because he wanted to save three rupees in bus fare for a job as a security guard in the central business district of Colombo. His walk had weakened him so much that when he presented himself, he was waved away. So he had to turn back and walk back, knowing that there's no money to feed his two kids at home. I had 100 rupees in my pocket, and this was the pocket money I had saved up, even though I had everything my day's pocket money. I gave that to him and he said, wow, a hundred rupees. I can feed my family for a week. And I thought, there's something wrong in this society when a 12-year-old has pocket money that could feed a starving family. The social disparities in Sri Lanka weighed heavily in my conscience. I developed a relationship with this man, and over the weeks and months, I saved up my pocket money and I would give it to him. 
And this, this, this little gesture developed a friendship that opened me out into an amazing world of beauty, of sophistication, of simplicity, of village culture, where the dignity of the human being had preserved over hundreds and thousands of years and evolved, where a simple meal was all that was required, and, and the rest of sophistication took place by the love, the care, the ingenuity, the richness that the human, human being can develop. With these experiences packed into my conscience, I headed to Australia. A passion for social justice. When I, when I arrived here, I remember, I, I would walk around the streets in amazement. And, and there were signs that said, no standing any time. <laughs> and I didn't realize these were for cars. <laughs> I was doing leaflet dropping, and every time I wanted to rest, there was a no standing anytime sign. <laughs> I'd arrive home really exhausted. <laughs> and then I realized, oh, someone told me it's for cars, you silly. God, I realized blind obedience, blind obedience, no. These days when I see Sri Lankans walking along the streets looking exhausted, I want to go up to them and tell them, That's not for us. <laughs> <laughs> I tried studying law, but I found that, that truth and justice were, if anything, distant second cousins. So I thought, truth, okay, let's, let's experiment. Let's try some experimentation with truth, Buddhism. I grew up in a country of Buddhism, so I headed off to a forest monastery. And the experience of truth was awaiting me in a very unexpected way. Unfortunately, in the monastery, there was a beautiful Buddhist nun. <laughs> and um, we had a torrid affair, and the monk kicked me out of the monastery after two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember telling the Dalai Lama this when I met him at Mastership. I said, do you know I had, Your Holiness, I had sex with a nun. <laughs> and he said, well, I, I thought that nuns were meant to practice abstinence. And I said, well, if they're meant to practice abstinence, you don't put them in the easiest garment to take off. It's a robe. <laughs> this, is, this is where, <laughs> I mean, a Buddhist nun and you have to have something in common. Yeah. <laughs> Easy garments to take off. He said, well, I'll look into it and I'll, I'll <laughs> maybe put some hooks or buttons or something. So I, after this experience, I headed off with my little day pack, traveling around the third world, entering communities that, had, that lived in forests. I experienced the Badui people in Indonesia, in the valleys of Java, living self-sufficiently, as they had done for hundreds and thousands of years, with incredible leadership, where all their needs were taken care of. They grew their own food, they wove their own fabrics for their clothes, and if there was anyone in the tribe who had curiosity about the outside world, the leaders would send them on a walk to, Indo to Jakarta, to just go and see how mad the outside world is, and they'd come back convinced. The Talk Batu in, in the Philippines, a tribe that had lived in caves till the 1970s and was only discovered then. When I entered this tribe, they, they embraced me with love and warmth and openness, as though I was a long-lost family member. They killed the only chicken and fed me, gave me the best place in the hut to sleep in. And when I left, they cried. The same in the Amazon. I arrived in Havana, and I met a man on the street. In, in one hour, we were back in his house having dinner with his girlfriend and his girlfriend's mother-in-law. Um, 
with his mother-in-law. And then I found myself lying in bed in an attic in Havana with this man I had met only three hours ago, his girlfriend and his girlfriend's mother. No, nothing happened. <laughs> Relax. But this was about trust. Trust and openness. And this, this incredible quality where I experienced such an incredible level of welcome, of embrace, where people took me for who I was. I, I came back to Melbourne and I thought, how do I crystallize these experiences and, and convey it to the community in a modern Western democracy? And then I thought, food. Food is a great vehicle. When we sat down in a forest and we shared food, wow, there was an incredible feeling of affinity, of, of, of closeness. So I found a little shell of a shop in St. Kilda, emptied my bank account into it, and got all the equipment necessary to start up a restaurant. And apart from the ovens and the coffee machines and the dishwashers, I also got a little wooden box. Put it in the counter. And we opened the doors. And people would walk in. There's a menu on the wall. Warm Vietnamese salad, Moroccan hot pot. And people say, hey, what, what about, uh, how much is that? Well, they, there is no price. There's a box over there, you can, you can pay whatever you want. People are amazed. This, this is not going to last. Are you crazy? You're trusting people? I wanted to submit myself to the people around me. Freedom. We fight for freedom. We send armies overseas to protect our freedom. But do we know, do we recognize freedom when it is presented to us? Do we value it? Do we treat it with care and responsibility? This, this amazing experiment, I, I decided to commit to it to the nth degree, to submit myself completely. So I, I bought a tent from Target and I pitched it in the Elwood Tea Tree Reserve. I wanted to know what it is to live without money, to submit myself to the environment around me and see what happened. People would ask me, why do you live in a tent? And I said, oh, I misunderstood my Buddhist teacher who asked me to go out there and live with intent. <laughs> And live with the intent I did. <laughs> Over the last 12 years, the experiences I've had by opening myself out to the people around me has been incredible. Young people, a young person with a love to want to be a waiter with a pineapple strap to his head, I said, great, strap a pineapple strap too to your head. And an, an, uh, an old woman who could, 80 years old, a Sri Lankan woman who was this high, we had to buy her a pair of pump-up Reeboks so she could see into the pots as she stirred it. <laughs> a, a Tibetan refugee who had trekked with her family from Tibet to northern India and barely came out of it alive, now making momos in the restaurant. A high court judge being able to sit with a homeless man in the back of the St. Kilda restaurant and learn about each other's experiences. This is what we have made possible. By the focus being not on, what, not on what's in your wallet, not how you dressed, and the car you drove up to the restaurant in, but the sense of character, the passion, the commitment you bring to life.
here's a story for you. The head of the Jewish Democratic Society said, Shanika, I'd like to have our annual gathering here. I said, great. So the Jewish Democratic Society came and had their annual dinner. And after they had eaten, the head of the organization came up to me and said, wow, that food was amazing. It was like I was back in Israel. It was actually like my mother had cooked for me. Have you got my mother in the kitchen? I said, well, come and meet the person who cooked for you. And he did. And he met Yusuf, a Palestinian refugee. A man who had fled Israel, country hopped for five years, abandoning his five-year-old child, and come to Australia, and yet communicated his love, his care to people who would be deemed his enemies. This was an incredible experience for the gathering. So much so that they invited Yusuf onto the stage to share his experiences. It was an occasion of learning, of reaching across and embracing, of understanding. This is what is possible if we open ourselves out to each other. We can't afford not to. We have been led astray. It is time to get back on track. The English language, I think, is confusing. We call ourselves a human race, but this is not a race. This is not a competition. I prefer the term humankind. It implies kindness. We share an affinity. There is a richness that awaits us. And it relies on us, on our individual sense of leadership, on our ability to embrace, be open to each other, and all the answers to environmentalism, to the improvement of humanity, lies in this. It is time to unlock this. How about this? What do you think? That's one day of the year. Pay as you feel. Can we start with that? Thank you.